Good morning. A non bubbly Kim is weird. <laughs> She's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Alrighty. I'm always bubbly, bubbly inside today. She's bubbly inside today. <laughs> you know, we used to go to this other church prior, way back, whatever. And, I mean, you guys all know Kim, so it's not like. Over there, they didn't, not so much that they didn't know her, but they didn't know her. They didn't know us, whatever. And so, like, we would get to church. I mean, everything is fine, right? No problem. We get to church, and she'd be just bawling and crying and, and kind of being like she is right now. And <laughs> they thought I was beating her. <laughs> they wanted to counsel me about the secrets in our home. And I was like, what? It was, was oh, was like, what's wrong with Kim? I was like, I don't know. She was fine when we got here. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. I'm like, well, you know, if you have some abuse problems, like what? Pretty much. <laughs> All right, let's open up. With a, is it hot in here? Let's open up. It is. Yeah. Can we put it on 70, please? 69, 70. Just maybe this one. All right, let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, and that your word never changes, Lord. As we look at so many things people put their trust in, um, it's ever-changing knowledge, ever-changing direction, and, and there's no consistency, but your word remains the same because you remain the same. And so as we do get into your word, Lord, we ask, always ask for uh, conviction, for challenge, for change. We ask to be receptors of your revelation as you speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay, so we are in 1 Kings chapter 12. Um, this is entitled, Beware of the Counterfeit. In 1 Kings chapter 11, last week, we saw um, Solomon with his thousand wives and turning to worshiping um, idols and child sacrifice and the demon gods of the people uh, um, in support of all of his, his wives. And God told him, because you have done this, I'm going to rip the kingdom out of your out of your hand, but I'm not going to take it from you. I'm going to take it during the reign of your son. And then we saw um, three different adversaries, major adversaries that the Lord raised up against Sol Solomon and Jeroboam, one from the inside, one who Solomon had raised up and made him a leader over the northern mm -hmm. tribes. The prophet came and told Solomon, or told Jeroboam, he tore up his brand new robe, probably the robe that Solomon gave him, and tore it up in 12 pieces, gave Solomon two pieces and Jeroboam 10 pieces and said, this is what God is going to do with the kingdom. And so Solomon wanted to kill Jeroboam and Jeroboam fled to Egypt. And then after he died, Jeroboam came back to meet with Solomon's son, Rehoboam. And that's where we pick up right here. Now, one of the things that's pretty interesting, though, the last thing it says about Solomon in verse 43, chapter 11, it says, Then Solomon rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his place. <clears throat> Think about all the glorious riches and stuff we we're told about Solomon and how magnificent he was. But this is all the Bible says about his death. 
he rested with his fathers. It doesn't say anything about the nation mourned for Solomon and the people were fasting and this, that, and the other. And there was a, a great, uh, what do you call those things when they have the presidential kind of ceremony thing when somebody dies? Anyway, he didn't even get the procession that, uh, never mind, I'm not going to say it. So, <clears throat> Solomon was buried with his fathers, and Rehoboam became king. Chapter 12, verse 1. <clears throat> and Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. So it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it, he was still in Egypt, for he had fled from the presence of King Solomon and had been dwelling in Egypt that they sent and called him. Then Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he put on us, and we will serve you. <clears throat> okay, so the city of Shechem um, is really like in the center of Israel. It's about like 35 miles north of Jerusalem. And historically speaking, uh, Shechem, as far as Israel is concerned, had a lot of value. It was where God first met Abraham and spoke to him and told him, I'm going to give this land to your descendants. Um, you guys remember Shechem is also the city where Jacob's sons uh, slaughtered every, all the men in the city because Prince Shechem had violated their sister. Shechem was the city where uh, Joshua gave his farewell speech and challenged Israel, saying, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And, you know, there's a lot of historical stuff for Israel that happened in Shechem. And so Rehoboam went to this central place with all this great historical um, events that had taken place for everybody to reflect on. And that's where he would be anointed the new king. But instead of being met with high praise from the people and celebration, he was met with Jeroboam and a call from the people to do the right thing and lower their taxes. Seems like taxes is always the problem. <laughs> now, what's funny is the regular people want lower taxes. But the rich, powerful, elite people want higher taxes. And then the dumb people in the middle think lower taxes only helps the rich people. Solomon, he was a great king. Um, under his rule, the nation was rich. But in order for Solomon and those who were closest to him to live those luxurious, the luxurious, uh, lifestyles, they had to force people into high labor with low wages, and then they taxed them a high percentage on top of that. In Israel, there was no welfare system, meaning the government wasn't giving you anything. Everybody worked for the king so that he could take from them, and then after taking, he could take some more. And that's what God promised them. You guys remember way back in 1 Samuel when they first asked for a king. The Lord said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. And this is in 1 Samuel chapter 8. He will take your sons and appoint them for his chariots and to be his horsemen. And some will run before his chariots. Solomon, they said, had these dudes with long hair and gold dust sprinkled in it. They had to be like six feet tall and they ran before his chariots every single day. He said he will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. He will set some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest. Some will make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. And he will take the best of your fields, of your vineyards, and your olive groves, and he will give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain 
and give it to his officers and his servants. He will take your male and female servants, your finest young men and your donkeys, and put them to his work. And you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Well, that day that the people began to cry out is this day. In that passage from 1 Samuel, I counted the phrase, he will take like more than six times or he will appoint and he will give your stuff to somebody else. Now, check this out. Solomon was all into idol worship. He was into all kinds of crazy stuff. He had turned the nation away from God to doing the one thing that God said you should not do when he started the first uh, of the Ten Commandments. But check this out. The people of God didn't have anything to say about all the idol worship, the false gods, the, the blatant sexual immorality parading up and down the street and the child sacrifice. Their concern was the high cost of living and heavy taxes. In verse 5, so Rehoboam said to them, depart for three days, then come back to me. And the people departed. Then King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he st still lived. And he said, how do you advise me to answer these people? And they spoke to him saying, if you will be a servant to these people today and serve them, and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. Okay, so these older men were wise enough to give counsel to Solomon. And they gave Solomon godly counsel. But these were also the same men who saw their country being led down the wrong direction. And they gave Solomon, uh, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, the most godly, heavenly counsel every leader should heed. They told him, you're the king. You're the king, Rehoboam, and their grievances are valid. Therefore, use the position and authority that God gave you to be a blessing to the people by serving them as their shepherd. And in return, their hearts will be loyal to serving you. In Luke 22, 25, Jesus said, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those who exercise authority, authority over them are called benefactors. A benefactor is somebody who says, Because I'm here, you benefit. Therefore, I will dole out to you what I feel you deserve. And you should be happy that I gave it to you. This is coming from the kingdom. But this should not be so among you. On the contrary, he who was greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as one who serves. And again, in Matthew 20, 25, Jesus said, You know, the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. In other words, in God's economy, to whom much has been given, much more is required. See, God doesn't give us possessions, blessings, and authority to have others bow down to us. He gives us more in order for us to bow down and lift others up. Think about it like this, and this is seriously, think about it like this. There is not one thing man has or one thing man can accomplish that God needs. There's nothing we can offer him to make him better off. I mean, think about it. What are you going to give God and say, hey, Lord, this, this will really help you out? 
the Lord doesn't need us at all. Yet, the Lord, God, being the God of all creation, bows down to serve us. He provides us with a planet that not only has gravity, it has oxygen. It has rain and sunshine to make food grow. He keeps your heart beating without you even thinking about it. It's the Lord's love that causes him to serve us. And that should what makes that should be what makes us want to gladly serve him in return. Well, for Rehoboam, the thought of being nothing but equal to other men and being a servant to those lesser than me, common humans, was revolting. He heard what the older men said. Verse 8 says, but he rejected the advice which the elders had given to him and consulted with the young men who had grown up with him, who stood before him. And he said to them, what advice do you give? How should we answer this people who have spoken to me saying, lighten the yoke which your father put on us? Then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him saying, thus you shall speak to this people who have spoken to you saying, your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, my little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. So the first thing we see is that Rehoboam was greatly offended by the thought that he should serve the people. So he turned to his friends, his fellow palace brats, those who grew up with him. They were all children of lifelong politicians with no term limits. None of them or their parents ever had a real job. Their lifestyles were maintained by taxing the working people and their power was maintained by making policies that kept them in authority. Now notice, when he went to the older men, Rehoboam asked, how do you advise me to answer these people? But when he went to his homies, he said, what advice do you give that we should answer this people who have spoken to me? They were like, man, we're all in this together. So his homies, Rehoboam's homies, they grew up with him with the golden spoon because Solomon didn't like silver. They were all in the same boat together and they told him exactly what he wanted to hear. How dare these simpletons come to us demanding things. We're not in power to earn love and respect. We're here to instill fear and unquestioned obedience. So Rehoboam spoke to the older men, but he put his trust in his friends. But check this out. He never once sought the Lord for wisdom and guidance. In Jeremiah 17, 5, the Lord says, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert, and shall not see when good comes. God gave Rehoboam the kingdom, but he didn't see the good in that. I mean, he handed him the most richest, powerful nation on the planet. And the Lord continues, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads its roots by the river.
those elite minded people are offended at considering them anybody who considers them to be equals with those broke working people. You ever met an elite minded broke person? You high sedity, bougie, and broke. <laughs> Eating shrimp on your food stamps. <laughs> They're especially offended. <laughs> They're especially offended when those broke working people who have no power demand that they be treated equal because they have one set of rules for themselves and one set of rules for everybody else to follow. But true leaders are chosen by the people to follow. Dictators, tyrants, and politicians gain power through fear, manipulation, and deceit. True leaders are those who see the need of the whole and clearly lay out a plan for everyone to get there. But politicians tell people every lie that they want to hear and dictators crush any difference of thought. Politicians hate leaders and politicians desire to be dictators. Dictators are in a position where they no longer have to lie about what they're doing. And that's where politicians try to get. But leaders are there because they're straightforward, honest, and people willingly get behind it and support it. It's a big difference. So verse 12. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam <clears throat> on the third day as the king directed, saying, come back to me on the third day. Then the king answered the people roughly and rejected the advice which the elders had given him. And he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, my father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. So the king did not listen to the people, for the turn of events was from the Lord, that he might fulfill his word, which he had spoken by, Adonai, by Ado, Ad, Ahijah, the Shilite. Shy, no, like, shy, like, shy, like, that dude. To Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. <clears throat> in Ecclesiastes uh, 2.15, Solomon said, In my heart, I see it happens to the fool as it also happens to me. Therefore, I hated my life because of the work that was done under the sun. It was distressing for me for all his vanity and grasping at the wind. I hated my labor in which I had toiled under the sun because I must leave it to a man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will rule over all my labor, which I toiled, which I have shown myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. Solomon was getting old, looking around. He's like, man, I built all this up. I got a thousand wives. And all my kids are idiots. <laughs> and I got to leave it to them. So the people like Rehoboam lighten our load. And Rehoboam became Pharaoh. Instead of telling the people... I will let you go. He promised to force them to make bricks without straw. 
And verse 15 says, So the king did not listen to the people, for the turn of events was from the Lord, that he might fulfill his word which he had spoken by Ahijah. Now, this is where man makes a choice and God uses that choice to fulfill his word. God didn't force Rehoboam to be an idiot. But because the Lord already knew what he would do, he basically allowed things to take their natural course. Now, sometimes... God steps in by his grace when we make wrong choices and he changes the course of those things. But sometimes he allows them to play out. But whether he steps in and changes the course or allows it to play out, it's always for his glory and he will be magnified. Now, trying to reconcile, well, if God knows everything, why did he make Rehoboam king? I don't know. Nobody knows because he knows everything, right? He knows who he needs to put in place to do his thing to accomplish his will. But he doesn't make our choices for us. People always say, well, if God is so good, why does he let this, that, or the other happen? And then my question to him is, have you ever done anything wrong? Well, yeah. Did God make you do that? No. Okay, then. You made your choice and God allowed it. Okay, but what I do isn't as bad as what they do. He should allow my sin, but stop their sin. That's just the way we always rationalize things, right? Because my sin is good to me and their sin I don't like. It's bad when they do what I do because I'm different. So verse 16, now when all the people of Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king saying, what share have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tent, O Israel. Now see to your own, O house of David. So Israel departed to their tents, but Rehoboam reigned over the children of Israel and dwelt in the cities of Judah. Then Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was in charge of the revenue. But all Israel stoned him with stones, and he died. Therefore King Rehoboam mounted his chariot in haste to flee to Jerusalem. So all Israel has been in, Jer in rebellion against the house of David to this day. All right, so the people walked out of the meeting um, with Rehoboam and just basically told him to his face, we're done with you and the tribe of Judah, and we're going to do our own thing. Peace, right? But what Rehoboam heard in his own mind was, we're going home and holding our breath till we turn blue and you give us our way. And so he was like mad, like you guys disrespected me and walked out the meeting. I'm going to send my tax man to go get my money. And they stoned him. I mean, how dumb can you be? They said, lower our taxes. And he's like, no. They said, buy. So he tells the tax man, go get my money. And they stoned him. Suddenly, Rehoboam realized things had gotten real, and he jumped on his horse and fled back to Jerusalem. He's like, oh, you guys are serious. How jacked up is that for that dude? Like, man. Verse 20. Now it came to pass, when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had come back, they sent for him and called him to the congregation and made him king over all Israel. There was none who followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. And when Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, 
180,000 chosen men who were warriors to fight against the house of Israel that he might restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of God came to Shimei, Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, to all the house of Judah and Benjamin and to the rest of the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, You shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Let every man return to his house, for this thing is from me. Therefore they obeyed the word of the Lord and turned back according to the word of the Lord. Okay, so now we see the, the split officially. Jeroboam is in the north. It is now called Israel. Rehoboam is in the south. It is now called Judah. Okay, so this is where actually the term Jews come from. Um, because Judah was the biggest tribe and it stayed faithful to God longer than Israel, right? So everybody who wanted to worship God came south to Judah. They were in the land of the tribe of Judah, so they were called Jews. Does that make sense? So Hebrews, Jews, Israelites, they're all the same thing. Now, the cult people will tell you something different, but they're the same thing. It's just like being a American, a Californian, and a San Diegan. It's all the same thing. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. All right. All right. So, um, Rehoboam was ready to go to war and force the 10 northern tribes back into the nation. And then God sent his prophet to tell him, basically... Stand down. This is my doing. Now, what's interesting is Rehoboam respected the things of God. He even believed that they were true. But he didn't adopt them for himself personally. It's kind of like the people in the Bible Belt are a kid that grows up in a Christian home. They know and respect Christian beliefs. And they, they understand it as a way of life. I mean, they can even acknowledge seeing God work from time to time. But accepting the Lord as God and Savior is just not for me. Rehoboam knew God had spoken this prophecy to his father. And he knew that's why Solomon had wanted to kill Jeroboam. So when all of this came to pass, Rehoboam let it go as God commanded rather than try to fight against the Lord. Is that making sense? Yep. Okay. Verse 25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. Also, he went out from there and built Peniel. Peniel is where uh, Jacob and the Lord had a fight. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David if these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, the king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, the king of Judah. Okay, so God had already spoken to Jeroboam and told him that if you follow me, your kingdom will last. But for Jeroboam, following the Lord meant that the people would be led to following God rather than led to following him. He was afraid that they would go back to Rehoboam, not back to the Lord. He dismissed the whole heavenly spiritual aspect of things and could only see them through his natural eyes. See, to Jeroboam, if the people continue to worship God the way that the Lord had prescribed in the temple in Jerusalem, and they made sacrifices at the temple, they would follow Rehoboam. He didn't see it as them following God. So to him... Rehoboam and the temple were a threat to his power because in his eyes, God was nothing but a tool used to control people. Therefore, verse 28, the king asked advice. 
And he made two calves of gold and said to the people, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set up one in Bethel, which is in the north, I mean, in the south, and one, the other he put in Dan, which is further north. Now this thing became a sin for the people who went to worship be before the one as far as Dan. He made shrines on the high places, and he made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. Okay, so if Rehoboam became the Pharaoh and didn't want to let the people go, Jeroboam became Aaron and made golden calves. Now think about it. He could even point to the scriptures and tell the people, look, see, it's in the Bible. Aaron made golden calves, right? It's, it's right. It's in the scriptures, right? But it was Solomon's idolatry that primed the people and made them ready to accept idol worship. And Jeroboam, being keenly insightful to the ways of people, took advantage of that for his own gain. Now, you might ask, well, was Jeroboam saved? Because he got into idolatry just like Solomon, and Solomon was saved. No, Jeroboam wasn't. Jeroboam was religious as far as Jewish tradition and culture goes, but he never personally knew God. In fact, when you speak of Jeroboam, through the scriptures, he became God's standard of evil. He always compares everybody evil to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Jeroboam, he was one of those people who believed the things of God, yet at the same time rejected God. But he would use God as a means of gaining power and money because he was very aware of people's desire to spiritually worship. Some people are spiritual. It's like, okay, that's cool, but what spirit? <laughs> Now, there's a distinction between unbelievers and rejectors. Rejectors know what the truth is. They even believe it. But they reject it because to truly follow God and the truth cancels out their personal agenda. James 2.19 states, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Unbelievers, on the other hand, are those who have never examined the claims of God, not according to the scriptures. So they just don't believe any of it's <laughs> true. But whether they're an unbeliever or a rejecter, they're in the same boat because they're just two different sides of the same coin. Unbelievers... We can look at people who have never in their life picked up a Bible. They've never really dealt with any real Christians. And so they don't believe it because it's just like the Easter Bunny, right? But a rejecter is somebody who has seen God operate. They know real believers. They know it's true, but it's not for me because that interferes with my goals. 1 Timothy 6, 5 tells us that men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth suppose godliness is a means of gain. And that's the category Jeroboam and Rehoboam both fall under. Um, like Judas, for a while Jeroboam walked close to the light, but he never stepped into the light and accepted God in his heart. And like Judas, when trusting in the Lord and standing upon his word came at the cost of personal gain, Jeroboam forsook the way of God for power, riches, glory, and fame. So Jeroboam was like, 
hey, gas prices are way too high for you guys to go all the way down to Jerusalem. So I've made two major sites for you guys to worship. This is for your convenience. Plus, we'll put up shrines all over the place where you can stop in anytime, all over the country for easy access. In 2 Chronicles 11, 5, 15, I mean, it says, Then Jeroboam appointed for himself priests for the high places, for the demons and the calf idols which he had made. The high places, the demons, and the idols translates into many different locations to worship. Um, it, it translates into the idols to look at physically while you worship, and the demons are what's truly behind the worship. He created a feast one month later than the Day of Atonement to compete with the Lord's mandatory holiday. Um, 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians it says, We know that an idol is nothing in the world, nor what is offered to idols is, any, is anything. Rather, the things which people sacrifice to idols, they are sacrificing to demons and not to God. In uh, verse 32, it says, and my notes got me all twisted right here. Verse 32, it says, Jeroboam ordained, ordained a feast on the 15th day of the eighth month, like the feast that was in Judah. That would be the Day of Atonement. And offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel, sacrificing the calves that he had made. And at Bethel, he installed the priests of the high places, which he had made. So he made offerings on the altar, which he had made at Bethel, on the 15th day of the eighth month, in the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burned incense. So the Day of Atonement was in the seventh month. He made a, a great feast in the eighth month to offset it. And 2 Chronicles 11, 13 through 17 gives us a little, a little more information. And it says, And from all their territories, the priests and the Levites who were all, who were all in Israel took their stand with Rehoboam. For the Levites left their common lands and their possessions and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam and his sons had rejected them for serving as priests to the Lord. And after the Levites left, those from all the tribes of Israel, such as had set their heart to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice to the Lord God of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam the son of a Solomon strong for three years because they walked in the way of David and Solomon for three years. Okay, so when this split happened, God was doing a sifting and a shaking. Everybody who wanted God came south. Everybody who wanted idolatry went north. God was, again, separating the wheat from the tares. You know, a lot of times we're sitting in church with a whole bunch of unbelieving idol worshipers. And you really don't know until something in society brings it to its head. And then you're sitting there like, I thought you were a Christian. Like, how do you even believe that? Because they're in agreement with the world. Now, check this out. There's nothing new under the sun. Jeroboam looked at the way God said to worship. He knew it. It was his culture. It was his history. So he designed a counterfeit and laid it down beside it. 
he pointed to the scriptures and said, look, the high priest made golden calves. We can have golden calves. And instead of going there on the great feast of atonement, we'll have feast here. And instead of having one place to worship, we'll have several places to worship. It's all for your convenience. In 313 AD, Constantine made Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire. After making Christianity the state religion, all of the politicians, the elites, the scholars, the philosophers, the pagan religious leaders found themselves out of a job and on the wrong side of the empire. So they converted to Christianity and they created the Roman Catholic Church. And what they brought with them was all of their philosophies, all their intellectualism, and all of their idol worship. The Roman Catholic Church, in order to separate itself from the Jews, created Easter Sunday as opposed to Passover. See, Passover happens on the 14th of Nisan, which is the 14th of May, whatever, whatever, when it falls in between May and April. They set up a counterfeit and made it on a Sunday every single year. So while there's Passover, which is the Jewish holiday when Jesus was crucified and then resurrection day being three days later, the Roman Catholic Church set up Easter Sunday. So it's always on a Sunday. But Passover doesn't always fall on a Sunday. It's like your birthday. It changes every year, right? So resurrection day is really not Sunday. It's whatever day it falls on. Anyway, so all of these people converted to Christianity. They brought all of their stuff with them and married the church to the devil. They didn't get rid of their idols. What they did is they changed all their Aphrodites and Zeus's into Mary and Joseph and saints. They kept their statues. Is that what they, kept everybody? they kept their incense burning, all their pagan practices, and just put Bible names on top of it. And just like Jeroboam, who made anybody a priest, the Roman Catholic Church created a new priesthood. Jesus had did away with the priesthood. Mm -hmm. They created a new priesthood and eventually the Pope. Mm -hmm. Now, when the government appoints faith leaders, those leaders aren't leading according to the faith but according to what the government wants you to obey and believe. There's nothing new under the sun. We can look at now as some churches are approved of and accepted by the government. You got women elders and openly practicing homosexuals as leaders in the church. But that's the rainbow that the government accepts. As long as you don't stand on the word. As long as you're not one of those hateful Christians that doesn't love sin. There's nothing new under the sun. What we have to be aware of is the counterfeit. So we have to stick to the word. Allow the word to change us. I may feel this way. I can reason with my homies and come up with a plan that way. It can be like Jeroboam. 
and reason with myself and the devil and come up with a new scheme. But it's all counterfeit. If we stick to the word as it is written, we'll be in line with the spirit. What's amazing is nobody looks at a stop sign and says, well, today it means yield. (laughs) But for some reason, when you pick up the word of God, oh, that's not what it meant. Uh, He was wrong. Times have changed. God hasn't changed. Get on the freeway going the wrong direction and you'll find out traffic hasn't changed. The truth remains. So let's beware of the counterfeit. Lord, we thank you for your word today. And we thank you that you reveal to us your will, your way in the scriptures. You put it on paper. It's not digital where it can be deleted and altered. It is what it is. So let us be transformed by the renewing of our minds and converted in the heart, mind, and soul to the way of your word, being led by the spirit. Make us ever wise to the deceptions of our own heart, the schemes and plots of the enemy and the distractions of the world. And when we stumble, O Lord, we pray for grace. We thank you for mercy. And let us uphold one another in love as you have commanded. In Jesus' name, amen.